Politico reporter Gabby Orr joins us for a deeper look at these and other stories. Gabby, good morning. Good morning. Let's let's start with the story that Michelle mentioned here. What what if anything do we think the the Manhattan DA's office could be looking at with regard to to Manafort? Well, right now I think they're looking at heavily redacting this case filing, <laughs> um, which is why we haven't seen, seen it, it yet. It hasn't <laughs> been made public, and the reason for that is there could be significant um, indications in this report about what direction they're heading and whether or not um, Paul Manafort is being charged with conspiracy. We know that he shared polling data during the course of the 2016 Trump campaign mm -hmm. with Russian officials. Um, we know that he has faced charges over his involvement in Ukraine, um, lobbying on behalf of Ukrainian authorities and, and individuals. Um, there are so many different aspects of this potential case filing that could create significant problems for Paul Manafort. And the other thing that we could be looking for is whether or not um, there's going to be any indication of how cooperative he was with the special counsel. Um, of course, this is going to make a sentencing recommendation. And based on that, we might have some indication that he was either very cooperative at the beginning um, or not cooperative at all. The big question is when Mueller's report will land. What are your sources telling you? You know, there was um, some early reporting last week that indicated it might land this coming week. Mm -hmm. We were told yesterday by a senior DOJ official that that's actually not going to be the case, mm -hmm. but that it doesn't seem to be far off. So there is hope that this investigation is going to wrap up in the future, um, soon at least. But of course, once it does, that could only you know, indicate that, that uh, House Democrats use whatever is in the Mueller report as sort of a roadmap to continue their own oversight and their own investigations, and that could drag on for, for years as long as they maintain control of the House. And while the president's not going to have to deal with that Mueller report, it appears next week while he is at this second summit with North Korea, he may have to deal with testimony from Michael Cohen, and you find that timing interesting. It is interesting. Um, you know, it's a huge, two huge events, one happening domestically, the other happening on the international level. Um, and the president, you know, some of his advisors are sort of worried going into the second summit with Kim Jong-un that he could make a irrational decision, he could make a broad concession, um, strictly because he wants to distract from whatever is happening on Capitol Hill. Right. Um, and, and, you know, with Michael Cohen appearing before um, the, the, you know, House Democratic panel, um, there are so many things that we could learn when he does testify um, just about his relationship with Trump. Um, and, of course, we could potentially see Democrats seize on something that he says and then launch another investigation into the president. Meanwhile, Democrats are moving, have moved to block the president's national emergency declaration. Um, when this gets to the floor for a vote, are there likely Republican defections here to, to in this case? Absolutely. Um, that's, a, that's a huge risk, and it's one of the reasons why the president was initially encouraged not to pursue the path of invoking emergency powers. There are several Republicans who have expressed concern about this, um, not only for ideological reasons, but also because they think that it really puts uh, Republicans in the danger of having a precedent set that could backfire in the future, especially if a 2020 Democrat takes control of the White House. Um, and, and it's not just in the House where we could see this. I mean, Nancy Pelosi is making a pretty politically savvy move here, putting Republicans on the record against the president. And if this moves forward to the Senate, um, there are also several Republican, mem Republican members, um, people like Senator Lee, Senator Rubio, Senator Sass, who all could vote against this as well. So the 2020 race just got a little bit wider this week. Bernie Sander, uh, Sanders entered. What, what does he bring in this open field? Well, I think we saw that the energy is still very much behind Bernie Sanders. Um, when he announced his campaign in 24 hours, <laughs> he raised fundraise. six yes. million yeah. dollars. Six million. Which, I mean, in the first three hours, he blew past the fundraising record that Kamala Harris had set yeah. in her first 24 hours after announcing. Um, and that sort of surprised a lot of people. There were did. people who thought that, you know, Bernie Sanders, yes, he is old probably news. the most progressive, but he's old news. He's much older than a lot of the other candidates in the field. Um, and yet we see that the momentum is still very much behind him. He has the name ID from so, the last time around. Gabby, if you're Joe Biden, what do you take from that? I think that there's... You know, on the one hand, um, <laughs> if you're Joe Biden, you're certainly a more moderate candidate in mm -hmm. the sense that he would have appeal um, among some of those working class um, blue collar voters who supported President Trump. Um, and, and yet you look at the energy that's behind Joe or behind Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. and it might indicate that maybe this isn't the right time to right. jump into the field. Right. You feel the burn. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Gabby Orr, thank you. A wealth of knowledge today on many topics.